Hello, I'm joined again today by Richard German, a lecturer in Asian Studies and International Relations at the University of Southern Queensland. Hi Richard. Hello Anna. We're going to be talking about regional imperatives in the Pacific region today as part of our continuing examination of the regional imperatives of Asia and the Pacific. So Richard, I was thinking about the Pacific region and what are some of the regional imperatives of the region from your uh, point of view? Well, one of the key things is to provide security. So that's both security from you know, any external threats, which of mm -hmm. course are quite low in the Pacific Island region, but also the human security dimension to provide people with those basic requirements of life, which will mean that they're more happy and contented mm -hmm. and um, you've got a more stable political and social situation as a result. Right. So political instability has sort of been a feature of the region for some time in varying degrees. Why do you think that's occurred? In some cases, the underlying problem is you know, essentially poverty. Mm. You've got countries like the Solomon Islands that have got a GDP of around $600 US per person per year, so it's mm -hmm. quite low uh, compared to somewhere like Fiji that's got about 2000 mm. um, In the case of the Solomons, you've got a life expectancy of about 66 uh, 66 years for women, 64 for men. This is again quite low by developed country standards. But you've also got 75% of the population being engaged in you know, subsistence agriculture and fishing. So the underlying conditions that are the economic conditions are not terribly good. When you put on top of them the ethnic conditions between people from Guadalcanal and Malaita, that you know, creates greater stress on these societies. Mm -hmm. And so the economic situation for a number of these countries sometimes can be quite dire and they often rely on remittances from those who have moved to other areas such as Australia or New Zealand and working there remitting money back to friends and family back home. I guess probably one of the industries that is very um, economically profitable would be tourism throughout this region. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, tourism is quite important, um, though, of course, to have tourists, you have to have stability. Yes. So while you've got countries like Fiji, Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands with reasonably similar um, conditions for tourism at optimum low rainfall times of the year, in places like the Solomon Islands with the problems that came from the uh, intergroup tension mm -hmm. that led to the Australian intervention in 2003. I mean, that, that's a bit of a death knell for tourism. No one wants to go on holidays where yeah, there's likely to be violence in the streets. Mm. Um, so, you know, their tourism industry really didn't get off. In the case of uh, somewhere like Vanuatu, just to the south, um, a very small tourist industry. Um, and again, that does provide those sorts of benefits. When we look to Fiji, we've got a quite different situation because historically, of course, Fiji was a stopping point for cross-Pacific flights. So they had mm -hmm. the, the whole issue of having an airport, having airlines going there. So it was quite natural that a tourist industry would develop first from the stopover then to actually those um, Australians and New Zealanders who go for the one week, two weeks mm -hmm. and have a good time. Now, that's what contributes to the you know, improved um, economic conditions there, of course, along with sugar and light manufacturing. But mm -hmm. you've still got 67% of the population of Fiji um, being engaged in subsistence agriculture. Mm. You know, it does provide that extra buffer, though. Yet, of course, without the security, um, you know, you've got problems for tourism. Now, Fiji um, is a very safe place, of course, mm -hmm. from a tourist point of view. But they have had, um, you know, the military takeover starting in the mid-1980s, um, the more recent um, disturbances of the last decade. Um, so these sorts of things can create a negative impression in the public mind. Of course, from the Fiji population's point of view, they're desperate to maintain mm. good relations with the rest of the world. Um, tourists are probably absolutely safe there um, because you know the government's so keen to keep the tourist dollar in. But again, small instability can send tourists off to another location. So you don't get that economic support that um, would normally come. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the other problems that they do face is uh, economies that run on two different streams. So you might have an economy uh, that's geared towards tourism, which then means products and services might be out of reach of the subsistence farmers. So that also can cause tensions. Yes, and you can have jealousy uh, within communities between some people that are slightly more affluent than others. Mm -hmm. Fortunately for most of the South Pacific countries, um, there's that strong sense of traditional sharing and custom relationships, which does make people uh, more inclined to share the benefits of their wealth with friends and extended family. Um, but, you know, that can cause problems as well. 
Um, you know, really, we've got a situation where this part of the world is existing economically at a much lower level. And to a great extent, you know, people might be reasonably contented. But of course, when it comes to health issues, mm. um, you're not really contented when your family's sick and you can't get no. medical assistance. That's right. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. I think you've given the students a lot to think about as they look at the regional economic imperatives of the Pacific mm. region. So thank you. Thanks, Anna.